Uh, seeing the defendants uh, was also an awesome experience, uh, and particularly the interplay uh, that Goering had with the defendants. He sat on the front row seat uh, on a corner, and there were about ten. There were about ten defendants on one row and ten on the other, and all he had to do is sort of nod his head or shake his head or raise a finger, and and someone would react in that group, and that lasted for the entire trial. Uh, he, he had a very powerful, dominant personality, uh, and uh, it, I, I, I never tired, very frankly, of being in that courtroom. Um. You did have a chance to, uh, obviously, you wrote about our guy, Robert Jackson. Did you have a general impression of, of his presentation, whether he had uh, the command of the court? Uh, Mr. Justice Jackson did a terrific job in the indictment. Uh, he, had about, he had some problems with Gehring. He decided that he was going to uh, uh, do the questioning cross-examination uh, cross of Gehring. Uh, according to uh, uh, his chief of staff's son's book, former Senator Chris Dodd, uh, his, Chris Dodd's father, you know, was chief of staff to uh, Justice Jackson. And uh, Dodd thought he was going to do the uh, uh, cross-examination of Gehring. Uh, Jackson did a good job on part of it, but on when it came to historical detail, he just didn't have the history uh, to, to argue with, with Gehring. And uh, at most, uh, I think the correspondence generally uh, uh, said that uh, it would be about a tie at best for Justice Jackson's performance with Gehring himself. And I remember, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I reflected that view in my own uh, report, and I remember next morning when I was walking into the courthouse, uh, I ran into uh, Tom Dodd, and he said, you were pretty hard on the boss last night. Uh, Let me tell you how hard you were. It just, <laughs> just happened to have. Uh, this is March 19th, 1946. This is your words, Harold Burson. <laughs> Mr. Justice Jackson faced the four-nation tribunal again. I must insist, he pleaded, that the witness answer the questions directly. It is clear, he continued, that Gehring had assumed an arrogant and contemptuous attitude which is giving him the type of trial he never gave to any person, living or dead, in Germany. That's what you said. As the eyes of the courtroom refocused from prosecutor to tribunal, presiding Justice Jeffrey Lawrence announced the court would adjourn, for already it was after 5 o'clock. But, says Harold Burson, but as the day ended with the suspense as of a Pulitzer Prize second act, the talk among newspaper correspondents boiled down to a single comment. Gehring so far, they said, has had his own way. It's high time. Someone stopped it. This has been a report from AFN correspondent Harold Burson. We return you now to the AFN net room, newsroom in Frankfurt. Yeah, yeah, you know, when I hear that sort of stuff, I wonder if I could write it now. <laughs> uh, the, the person who really stopped him was uh, uh, Sir David Maxwell Fife, who was uh, the assistant chief prosecutor for the Brits. And he really knew the history. And I'll give you one example. Uh, there were f uh, four uh, English, English uh, air airmen, uh, pilots, uh, who uh, were prisoners of war. And uh, Goering, who was head of the Luftwaffe, didn't trust the rest of the military people. And he insisted that all captured pilots or Air Force people from the United States and Britain would be in uh, prisoner camps that were operated by the Luftwaffe. Uh, and the, the 
the, these four British uh, officers were uh, uh, tried to escape, were captured, and were brought back to the camp. About three weeks later, the same four officers did the same thing again. They tried to escape, they were captured, and they were brought back. Uh, uh, they were executed, and another 25 British pilots of airmen were executed also. And uh, so David Maxwell Fife, his first question to Gehring on that issue was, uh, uh, you, you're a military man, what is the first duty of a prisoner of war when he's captured? And Gehring said, of course, it's to try to escape. And he said, uh, do you think that uh, people who try to escape uh, should be uh, uh, severely punished? And Gehring said, no. And he said, do you think they should be executed? He said, absolutely not. That was not my uh, idea. In fact, it was probably the biggest argument I ever had with the Fuhrer. And then Gehring denies it. Uh, so David Maxwell Fife pulls out this document. Uh, Gehring had signed it, and below his signature he wrote, uh, this will be a good lesson for the other prisoners so they won't try to escape. And the one thing that Gehring was very protective of was his military honor. He, he regarded himself as first as a soldier. And you know, he won two of the equivalents of the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War I. In fact, you know, one of the main reasons that he committed suicide was he said that he would gladly uh, stand up and, and be shot by a firing squad because that was a soldier's death, but he thought hanging was an ignoble death. And so therefore he was able to engineer this deal to commit suicide.